My name is Bruce Monker and welcome to another edition of Shots with Soldiers. This is our 10th episode. Before we begin and I introduce our guests, uh, I just wanted to give you a little breakdown on what we're about. So we are valor in the presence of the enemy. And what we've done is we've started making a uh, group of, of people, like-minded people, including General Rick Hillier, Captain David Mack, Gordon uh, Henderson, Mick Zosky, and Kevin Reed. And we have put together this group. So that we're, our goal is to uh, give somebody the Victoria Cross from the Afghanistan war, uh, to have somebody elevated from the Star of Valor. Well, through this crazy four months, and we've, we've attracted over 12,000 followers on our social media, and we've grown at an exponential rate, uh, we've decided that, uh, yeah, we want to franchise this and we're going to keep uh, growing and expanding to other areas. So this is us. So we need you guys to your help. We need you guys to share this. We need you, this video, share this, uh, like our stuff and help get the word out that we are going to start commemorating Canadians from the past, present, and uh, getting these stories out there to you, the Canadians, and hopefully we will be able to uh, spread uh, these uh, amazing stories of heroism to all Canadians. Now I'd like to introduce you to our great, great host, recently retired as host and managing editor of CTV's W5, while founding anchor of Global National for a decade, covering 9-11 live and won a Gemini Award for a series of reports in 2007 from Afghanistan while anchor of ABC News, Good Morning America, covering the conflict of, in Iraq, diplomatic summits in Moscow, and, th uh, and throughout a career covered Canadian and United States politics. Worked with a small group of veterans to get Kijiji to adjust its job search algorithms to elevate veterans and helped raise money and profile for Trouble Victor Group, Invictus Games, and True Patriot Love. Please give um, uh, help me give a welcome to Kevin Newman. Oh, thanks, Bruce. Appreciate it. Um, it's interesting when you say like uh, that, you know, that that Victoria Cross is well known in history, but what many Canadians may not know is that it's been repatriated and that we are capable now of, of giving that highest honor to uh, one of our soldiers, but have yet to give it to uh, someone who served in Afghanistan. And so that's part of the reason that, you know, um, we come together. Um, filmmakers, veterans, journalists, and others is because uh, we believe in that cause and we believe that um, it's time. And so I, I thought that I would share a story tonight um, uh, about Afghanistan, um, which is sort of my only personal connection uh, to a conflict because it really was the conflict of, of my generation and my time. And as always in these um, encounters, uh, we're gonna talk about a specific soldier but um, in this case, I think he represents many of them. And, um, and um, some context, I think, to begin with, first of all. Uh, I had been uh, a journalist for about 20 years, a television journalist at various networks uh, when 9-11 happened. But I had um, never reported uh, from an active war zone. And for a Canadian journalist, that was fairly typical of my generation. War reporting was done. Uh, but it was by a select few, uh, and usually from the foreign bureaus. Domestic reporters, which is what I was in Canada and the US, tended not to do that because that wasn't our skill set. Um, and almost never uh, when we were deployed with soldiers would we actually report alongside them in combat. Um, I had been to Sarajevo at one point uh, for that. I. Uh, covered Gulf War one and two, but those those were were typical of the time in that you know you would go to Qatar or you'd go to um, uh, some place you'd end up in a hotel you'd go to a briefing by uh, a senior uh, official and you'd never actually see uh, what combat looked like. We were kind of sequestered um, from Canadian soldiers and from deployed soldiers because I think the thinking at the time was that you know they wanted to limit. Um, our exposure uh, to soldiers and they wanted to control the message a little bit better. Uh, they wanted uh, troops and soldiers to be contained in, in different silos so that the um, Canadian Armed Forces spoke as one. And so 
um, consequently, you know, even even covering conflicts, uh, the military to most Canadian journalists at the time um, tended to be the public affairs officers and maybe a couple of uh, very senior ranked uh, generals uh, that would uh, do the briefings. And, and the relationship, I think it's fair to say, was often adversarial because, you know, uh, the belief was that operational security concerns kept information flow very, very tight. Um, so some reporters would head out on their own, but they didn't get very far because usually there were military checkpoints and armed militias, and you couldn't really cover war. War, I think, for for many viewers of, of television news was kind of antiseptic, and I remember that especially during the Gulf War. And then I think the relationship between the, the two became especially strained uh, after the Somalia incident, the Somalia inquiry, when you know, a lot of uh, regular troops uh, blame the Canadian media for um, the end of the Airborne Regiment and, and, and what happened there. So, um, you know, then Afghanistan started. There was the, the initial mission in Kandahar up to Kabul. And uh, it was pretty much the same thing at that time. You know, we were, we were kept in very uh, contained situations. But then something really brave happened. Um, as our mission was winding down in Kabul, and we were redeploying to Kandahar. Um, a couple of public affairs officers at DND proposed to General Hillier, who's a big part of this project, that instead of restricting reporters to CAF and, and the regular briefings in Afghanistan, that um, they would look back a little bit farther to the last act of combat duty. And that was World War II, and in some ways the Korean conflict. When at that time, uh, Canadian reporters expected to be and were embedded uh, within uh, the Canadian military, uh, outside of, of the wire. So this, um, this proposal went to the general and it, it, it actually fit his concept uh, for what he was trying to accomplish at that time, I think pretty well. He, 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 he had argued, it's well known that um, he wanted the Canadian military to go into Southern Afghanistan because he felt that he, the CAF needed to be reminded that it was a fighting force. But more importantly, Canadians needed to be reminded that our military was a fighting force. And so inviting reporters to capture that and be part of that was endemic to um, uh, um, the evolution that he wanted Canadians to uh, feel in, in their perceptions of, of what our military was. And so this embed program began. And um, I have to tell you, uh, I would get calls from um, reporters from other countries, former American colleagues from Britain, asking how they could get embedded with the Canadian military because it was seen to be um, exceptional. And uh, it was exceptional because of the a level of trust uh, that had been put into the hands of journalists and the journalists had accepted uh, along with the responsibility that they had of um, not reporting things that might uh, jeopardize operational uh, readiness and security. Um, and it came, I mean, this, <laughs> I'll, I'll share one story. I, I was able to, in 2007, take our newscast at the time, Global National, and, and report it from, uh, from the CAF and from Kandahar. And I met General Hillier um, at the Kabul airport, and he looked at me, he said, you're not going to be another one of those reporters that comes and just stays inside the wire and would never leave CAF. And I said, well, General, if you can make this possible for me, um, I, I, I would love to go outside the wire. Um, but you know, it's it's. Uh, I need security. I need I need a bunch of stuff to get around, and so I was designated as an as an actual Canadian military general for two weeks, so that when they called up the Dutch and the Americans for some lift, they could say, "Yes, we have General Newman here, and he's requiring to be moved from point A to point B." So I don't know if I've ever shared that in public before, but I guess I have now. So thank you, General Hillier, because it really did provide much much better reporting. Um, but I had sort of a a, a, a luxurious view. Of, of, of the embed program. Most of the Canadian reporters were actually embedded much closer to the ground. And it was through that program and through traveling with um, many members of the Canadian Armed Forces that um, um, I first uh, got a glimpse of a, of a fellow by the name of Captain Matt Daw. Now to be clear, I never met Matt, um, but uh, people in my team met Matt. And as you'll hear in this story, um, he, um, he ended up becoming a pretty big part of my life. Uh, Matt was uh, guiding our global national team of uh, the reporter was Jazz Joe Hall and the photojournalist was Jeff Stevens. 
And um, they were embedded uh, with Matt and, and his patrol for about two weeks uh, in the Pantry District. And uh, I would watch the footage come in um, in the newsroom in Vancouver. And, and Matt sort of stood out because of how I saw him greeting my people uh, with the greatest of respect and with uh, an uncommon courtesy and um, general enthusiasm. Uh, Captain Matt Daw, uh, just from the footage, was obviously such a good guy, but he came from quite a, an accomplished military family. His father was a retired Lieutenant Colonel, uh, Peter Daw, uh, and Peter's four, all, all four sons were actually army officers. Matt was the youngest of the four. Uh, they're all studs. And uh, Matt's brother, Pete, you'll probably recognize Pete Daw, of course, now the Major General leading uh, Kansas.com. Now, Matt's dad didn't expect Matt to follow his older brothers into the military. Um, while like them, he was, he was good in sports and he had an interest, he had a bit of a wider scope. Um, Captain Dahl loved music. Um, he loved live theater. And it's maybe why he got along with our embed so well, because he was generally curious about uh, the little movies that we make uh, every day in our business. And I think he had an artist's understanding of why it was important that this be captured, that why it was important for us to be there uh, alongside he and his men. Um, he was commander of 8 Platoon C Company uh, of the PPCLI, and uh, he was on a PSYOPs mission uh, when my guys were uh, with him, trying to coax the uh, intel out of the locals there. And his dad told me that um, those soft skills uh, that Matt possessed were in some ways uh, made him a, a better soldier than either of his three other brothers for the Afghanistan mission. Because uh, for Matt um, and for success in that mission, it really was hearts and minds. Uh, Captain Dahl was funny. Um, he did wicked impressions of people. Um, he also had a young son waiting for him back in Canada and, and a wife that he had married uh, shortly after graduating from RMC. So I, I watched uh, Jazz and Jeff file their stories. Uh, and I remember very clearly at the time them getting on the phone and saying, this guy's, this guy's pretty special, um, that they really uh, respected uh, Matt's level uh, of engagement and feelings of protection. And um, I think that entire embed program, and Matt became a symbol of that to me, um, really had a profound impact in how that war was covered and how military has been covered ever since. Uh, they showed civilians like me what it was like to be a combat soldier. I grew up in a time when a, a guy in a military uh, uniform uh, seem, seemed odd. I, like, why would anybody want to do that to their lives? And I think that was true of many Canadians uh, of my generation. And um, through the embed program and through uh, being able to get close access and have real conversations with the soldiers in Afghanistan, um, I, I think I soon realized that, you know, we, we had more in our professions in common than, than separated us. I think it demystified journalists um, to some soldiers as well, not always happily. I've got other buddies who had, uh, you know, um, reporters tag along that they, they just thought is uh, largely dead weight. And there were a couple of rotten apples who were sent home and should have been. But I think mostly we earned uh, the grudging respect of uh, some soldiers for how we endured and the care that we generally took in uh, protecting their lives while also at the same time trying to report fairly uh, and accurately. And because there is this generation of uh, reporters in Canada who shared the experience of Afghanistan, um, I, I, I honestly think that the chain of command after the war and during it um, was held to account in ways that it might not have been otherwise. Because we knew uh, rank and file soldiers, not only the, the, the public affairs people and not only the, the senior, uh, senior officers, it has been reporters who served in Afghanistan who have held their feet to the fire on PTSD, on operational stress issues, on uh, a lot of the procurement issues uh, so that soldiers get the material and then sailors and, and airmen get the um, equipment they need. Um, we challenged the generals and the claims that they made. And uh, I think we also, because we have felt it, um, humanized and honored the sacrifice of those who did not return. And that includes Matt. Uh, about a month after our uh, cruise deployment with him, um, 
three platoon members were killed by an IED. And uh, two weeks after that, um, and he took that really hard. Two weeks after that, he was on a mission to try to find the maker of that IED. And Matt's uh, vehicle hit a 500 pound bomb that was buried in the road. Um, Captain Daw died instantly, uh, along with five other Canadian soldiers and an Afghan interpreter. And he was only uh, 27 years old at the time. He left behind his wife, Tara, um, a son, Lucas, who on July 4th will be as old as his father was when he signed up for the Canadian military. Lucas was two at the time. I remember uh, really clearly reading out Matt's name that night, uh, July 4th, um, on our newscast. And um, we would sometimes hear about uh, a soldier's death before we would broadcast it. We would wait uh, for headquarters to make sure that everybody in Canada that needed to be told would be told so that I wasn't the guy telling family and close friends. Um, and I remember reading out um, uh, Matt's name and uh, running that footage of his uh, incredible broad smile, uh, his sense of humor, his, um, his wily athleticism, and his real gentleness and, and kindness uh, shone through. Uh, he was one of the most senior casualties in rank uh, that we lost uh, as a country. And I sometimes wonder maybe that's why Matt um, keeps showing up in my life. Um, I'll tell you a couple of instances. I was interviewing Prime Minister Harper in his office uh, early in his uh, tenure. And um, I saw a picture of um, the, the soldier picture of Matt on the Prime Minister's uh, desk behind behind him, and um, I looked at him and I thought, "Is that is that Captain Daw?" And he said, "Yes." And he said that that was for some reason for the Prime Minister the one that um, he wanted on his desk to remind him every day of uh, the consequences of the decisions that he had to make. I saw Matt's picture again by accident behind the desk of Michael Byrne, who was the CEO of the Invictus Games. And, uh, and, and he had known um, his family. Um, I uh, became friends inexplicably with someone here in Toronto who was a member of Kansoff, um, who was on a, 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 an education break up at the Wilson Road facility. And he, um, he just took up a, a friendship and just um, said, why don't you come? And we, we, went, we had this great drunken night um, jumping over a fire pit. I don't know what happened, but... Um, a year later, he told me uh, as we were driving to my cottage and we'd become pretty good friends, I was telling him about Matt and I said, uh, and then he just said, I said, yeah, Matt was my best friend. And I'd known this guy for a year, but you know, those special forces guys, they're pretty good at keeping secrets. Um, and then I did a documentary with um, Gordon Henderson, who's on this call and uh, for Global. And um, we used Matt's footage again to represent um, the soldiers uh, that were uh, on assignment there. So in an odd and strange way, Matt's uh, short life story um, didn't end with his death. It seems to have grown in it oddly. His mother was actually a Silver Cross mother as well a few years back. And I um, had a conversation. I was able to have one with his brother, Pete, uh, a, a year ago and share some of these uh, memories. So as I said, I never met Matt, uh, but I met a lot of men like him in Afghanistan. And, and I, I, I count, it was pivotal in my life uh, because I think as I sit here today, as I think about all my close friends, more than half of them are, are veterans uh, of the Afghan campaign. So the experience was life-changing for me. And I, I know it's been life-changing for every other reporter that I assigned to cover it and were assigned by other people as well. And so, um, I would like to uh, toast Captain Matt Daw and the other men who protected all of our reporters uh, during the Afghan conflict, because I knew uh, through getting to know them and getting to know someone like Matt Daw, that's him with his son there 20 years ago, um, that my men and women were safe, that they were in good hands and that they were with people that cared to Captain Matt Daw. To Matt Daw. To Matt Daw.
Thank you for that opportunity. Uh, sorry. <laughs> it was incredible. Um, I will open it up to any questions that anybody has. Uh, does anybody want to start? Start us off. I'll, sp I'll speak about the MBEM program because it's interesting what you say, Kevin, because I was, I was briefly with Bruce's platoon, the uh, eight, the crazy eights. And I, when I was, I, I made a documentary <clears throat> for the CBC and when, we, when I was out promoting the documentary, some journalists really attacked the idea that I was embedded. There was one in particular who's a friend of mine and the whole interview was about how you can't be an objective journalist. You can't, if you're embedded, you become one of the boys. And, and I, I, I never got to the point of the film. And, I, and I, I remember in the interview saying, did you see the film? And he goes, no, I, I don't believe in the embedded program. So I went, I went to, with, you, you see it as a very positive thing. Other journalists did not. Yeah, no, that's very true. But, um, you know, in comparison to the kind of war coverage I mean, there were always the lone wolves, um, even in Afghanistan, that that did not uh, take part in the embed program because they didn't believe in it. And you know, hats off to them. You know, uh, Graham Smith was one of them from the Globe yeah. and Mail, who would go around and he'd he'd, he'd go he'd go full uh, full Taliban. They did great and reporting. Great reporting, fantastic reporting. Um, less easy to do for television, as you know, and for um, for film, uh, because you can't be as invisible by by growing a beard. Um, and, uh, but I thought it was, uh, I thought it was an improvement on the relationship between the military and journalists, uh, that I had experienced for the previous 10 to 20 years in, in my view, a vast improvement. And, um, <clears throat> you know, if you think of some of the reporting, yeah, maybe, maybe you do be, you do, you know, drink the Kool-Aid a little bit, but I think that's just all important context to know. And if you can, it, I think the embed program demystified um the canadian soldier and brought them down and brought them to a level of humanity that um ended up um um fusing uh the country to its military in a way that it hadn't been uh, for a very long time which personally um i i i, I supported any other questions yeah, Kevin, you said that um, like you've seen it from before the embedded program started and then obviously your experience in it. What would you, if if you would at all, what would you like to see in the future with regards to how um, journalists interact and are embedded with the military? If there's any changes you'd like to see or if you're just... Well, I mean, was? it's been interesting since Afghanistan, we've never really had that kind of embed program again. And in fact, I think we've gone backwards uh, away from that. The reasoning that is supplied is often because a lot of the um, um, uh, a lot of the threats are cyber threats now, and that there is um, you know identifying uh, the facial uh, identifying somebody in 2007 is different than it is in 2020. That there's a chance that somebody could um, target them, uh, target their families, and whatever. So, the military says no, you can't report on any um, any movement. So we, we generally we've never reported on on um, JTF two or or any of the special forces movements, uh, but that's now been extended in some cases to the Latvia um, program where, where you weren't allowed to film uh, the faces or identify the soldiers that were on the training mission. And um, I'd like to see that eased up because, um, you know, I, I think if you walk the streets of Toronto again or any other city, you said, did you know we're in Latvia? Nobody has any idea we were even there. And I don't think that serves the public interest. Thank you. Kevin, I've got a question for you. Um, and and uh -oh. the dog family, and he wouldn't let me plant one. So I was like, just, <laughs> I'm catching him totally off guard. Um, <laughs> The Daw family is a great example because, uh, you know, uh, I worked with Sarah, actually, uh, Pete's wife uh, worked for me. Um, and so, you know, we experienced that from Bay Street, you know, when Matt was blown up. Um, and, but they're tremendous human beings, not, you know, uh, not sort of the uh, one dimensional soldier uh, emblem and you know you and uh, Christy Blatchford and Marie Brewster have done some tremendous work 
you know, bringing the stories of the soldier back to the Canadian public. But uh, Kevin, you know a lot of us well, and a lot of soldiers well, in their post-military lives. Um, what do you have on store for us to talk about, you know, the human aspects of the soldier after the battle's done? Um, well, I think there's been a, f there, there was um, a lot of reporting. Um, I mean, I personally recognized exactly what you're talking about early and got involved in Treble Victor uh, because I wanted to offer my network to guys. Um, and I, I, I mean, um, I still, Sebastian Younger's book, Tribe, is still my guiding light on this stuff. <clears throat> that um, the problem isn't isn't with um, isn't with soldiers or 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 how they are. The problem is what they see in us in in the civilian life and um, the lack of um, you know uh, moral moral center for some things. And so I um, I know that. Um, I, th I wish more had done it, but I, I, personally, I can just, I guess, uh, speak for myself is what I've tried to do is, um, is, is use those, you know, 10 to 15 years that I had of network building and comfort building in this society uh, to help, um, to help explain it <laughs> uh, and, and help uh, open doors where I can um, to, be, to, um, to veterans. I'm not sure I'm really answering your question. Um, I, I do think that we've reached the point, sadly, 20 years, 15, 20 years later, um, where the, um, the military, the active military is, is, as I said, is largely invisible to Canadians again. Uh, veterans are not, however. I think their stories are being uh, maybe not told as often as veterans would like and not in the way always that they would like. But I do think that, um, you know the 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 plight for justice, you um, know, uh, in a, in, a, in the post-military life, is um, is by and large the sum total of, of military reporting um, currently, other than about machines. I'm going to jump in if I can, uh, Kevin. Listen, first of all, I mean you've been an incredibly loyal uh, personal friend, but also a loyal, committed ally to the veteran community. And, and I think we're all, you know, we're just very, very grateful for all the doors that you have opened um, and for the opportunities that have been created through your, your graciousness um, and, and your, the giftings that you've provided. Um, I, I do have a question. I'm just curious, you know, when, when I look at um, the British and, and the Americans and, and their own uh, reportage, we, how would you compare um, the different approaches that were taken are, are they comparable to the Canadians? Were were they? Um, did they go as deeply embedded as the Canadians? How would you kind of compare various sort of, uh, I, I guess, probably Anglo NATO countries? Uh, well, certainly um, in Afghanistan, and that's the only one I can talk to because I didn't really re cover the conflict in Iraq, which I know you were part of. Um, um, by far, it was the most advanced and the most uh, based on trust. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, I was getting calls from Americans wanting to pretend that they were Canadian reporters so that they could have met with the Canadians. And that was, um, that was exceptional. Um, and, and we went through, just so you know, we went through all of the, like we would get operational security briefings as well so that we wouldn't jeopardize um, dumb things like locations and, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't trip that things up. And then, um, it would go through, um, the military would have to feed out um, our stories and do a check on them, as is typical in times of war and in conflict zones. And they were um, remarkably uh, hands off unless it dealt with um, strategic issues. Um, even to the point that like, uh, you know, there were, there were, you know, some interviews that I got that they weren't pleased with. And I would always turn to them and say, now don't you take that out on them, I just talked them into it. Um, but it was a it was a very advanced program that hasn't really been equaled since. And I've often wondered, um, you know, what kind of post script was ever done uh, inside D and D H Q uh, for, or, or whether people just got all nervous again and different people were leading. You know, I think it I think it was it was General Hillier and uh, you know, 
um, who, who made it happen. And, um, you know, maybe since then, I, I, you know, people would always say to me, like, uh, if we cry too much coverage, won't, won't Canadians turn against the war? But I, re I remember very clearly in the Afghan war, when the, when the death count was rising, when, um, those, those hearses were moving along the 401, um, uh, Canadian results stiffened. And so what I always told soldiers was, you know what, um, you want people to know about the sacrifice because that um, that stiffens the spine back home. And uh, if you if you dehumanize a soldier, or if you which is what happened in Gulf War One anyway, it's like I remember trying to get in to interview pilots and they wouldn't let me. So I went in and interviewed the pilots' wives because they were often better interviews. And um, but the the hope was at that time to sort of you know if if people died, they didn't want Canadians to know them. But I I. I I believe that, um, you know, the way that I feel about Captain Daw um, is the way that many Canadians felt during that period. And I think it, it, it hopefully was, was felt uh, by the guys uh, in the dust. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I remember, you know, there was distrust and, uh, you know, placed and we were told to watch, you know, loose lips sink ships and whatnot, but um, I know that the guys after Gordon was, I, I was gone after, but Gordon was embedded with and things like that of that nature. And you always knew who some of your allies were. And I want to say, Kevin, you were always an ally for, to the, to the veterans and the veteran community and the soldiers. So I want to again, thank you for, do, for doing this. Take this opportunity to say, this has been another episode of Shots with Soldiers. Please like, and share, tell your friends, pass it on. And, uh, again, uh, the general sends his regards. Thanks you for stepping into those big boots that he, he has for doing this. And ladies and gentlemen, the 10th episode of Ten Shots with Soldiers, uh, we'll be back in two weeks.